Hi, I'm Malika Bilal and you're in the stream. Ethiopia's Prime Minister has been widely praised for pushing through major changes during the first year of his term. But can Abi Ahmed build on his breathless start and solve a series of seemingly intractable challenges? Send us your thoughts through Twitter and YouTube. Abi mania has swept parts of Ethiopia and the wider region since Abi Ahmed became prime minister a year ago. Before his election by the country's ruling coalition, Abi was a little-known politician. Now, he is a leading nominee for a Nobel Peace Prize. This clip from Al Jazeera's Mohamed Ado highlights just some of the changes in Ethiopia under Abi's watch. It's been a good first year for Prime Minister Abi Ahmed. At 42, the Ethiopian leader is the youngest on the African continent. So far, Abiy Ahmed's achievements include freeing thousands of political prisoners and closing the country's infamous torture chambers in the capital Addis Ababa. Ethiopia had long been known as one of the world's worst jailers of journalists. Within months of taking office, Abiy released them all. He has appointed women to half the cabinet posts. Parliament has also accepted his female nominees for president and head of the Supreme Court. But it's the speed with which he ended a 20-year conflict with neighboring Eritrea and established close ties with its leader, Isaiah Safuwerki, that has astounded so many. But it's not all good news. Abiy and his government must tackle long-simmering ethnic tensions as well as economic and environmental problems threatening people's livelihoods. Can he pull it off? Well, joining us to discuss this, we have Abebe Galau, a journalist with Ethiopian satellite television and radio known as ESAT. Sidale Lema is editor-in-chief at the Addis Standard. She joins us from Frankfurt, Germany. And Goitam Gabriliwao is a political analyst. He joins us from the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa. Welcome to the stream, everyone. Abebe, I want to start with you because it's so good to have you back in the studio. Thanks so much. But I want to remind our audience, especially for the ones who are true stream fans, they might remember this. Take a look at my computer here. The last time you were here, uh, June 26, 2012, we both look a little bit younger in this clip here That's right. in an old set. But you were here under not such great circumstances. We were talking about the country's human rights record because you were living in D.C. in exile after having been charged in absentia for terrorism because of your journalism. And so I want to fast forward just a little bit to this photo posted on Facebook, went viral. You can see why. Abebe, you posted this. Ethiopia, we are coming at last. We're ready to fly home in minutes. Anything is possible for Almighty God. Free at last, free at last. This was in February uh, the 14th. Talk to us about this moment. Going home for the first time in what, 20, 20 years? Yes. I have been in exile uh, for uh, two decades. I left Ethiopia in 98, uh, which was uh, the start of uh, the Ethiopian conflict. I uh, went to London. From London, you know, I lived in London for about uh, nine years and came to the US. So returning home after 20 years of exile was a unique experience for me because I didn't even uh, see some members of uh, my family, including my mom and dad. Wow. So it was really uh, a great moment for me, a uh, very emotional moment. At the same time, uh, what struck me a lot was the changes uh, that were uh, going on in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. I witnessed that uh, people are free now. Uh, they can speak up their mind. Uh, they are not afraid of security forces anymore. But still, uh, there is anxiety and a lot of concern because of the security situation. There, there is. Uh, some sort of uh, a breakdown of law and order in many parts of Ethiopia, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, dampening you know, the successes of uh, the prime minister. Uh, he has achieved a lot in one year mm -hmm. because Ethiopia is a country uh, which faced uh, a lot of challenges, especially uh, during the last five years. Of course. Uh, so, so you mentioned that he's achieved a lot in, <clears throat> in, in this past year. Do you chalk up the fact that you were able to get on this plane and go to Ethiopia with others and see your family for the first time in 20 years? Is that one of his successes? Do you attribute that to absolutely. his administration? Absolutely, because he opened up uh, the political spaces. There were a lot of people and groups uh, which were designated terrorists, including myself. You know, I was uh, charged with terrorism, as you said, and uh, sentenced in absentia for 15 years. 
So I tell you this going back home. As a free person, it was uh, a unique experience for me. I bet. So, Dale, you, you heard here what Abebe had to say, looking at this from a journalist's perspective over this past year. How would you rate the administration of Abe Ahmed? Um, I, I would just add a few points on what uh, my colleague Abebe said that, yes, um, ever since over, over the last one year, um, there has been a great opening up of the political space. Um, to my concern, that was not accompanied by opening up of, um, let's say, the economy or strengthening of the security and returning you know, the rule, rule of law back. So this great opening of the political space that saw some unimaginable things happen, such as the return of Abba himself, um, hasn't been matched with, with other, um, particularly in the security area. It has not been matched with the same uh, enthusiasm, let me put it like that. So yes, on one side, it's uh, what he has, the prime minister has achieved, although I must say here that it is what the party wanted um, as a means of survival. But the prime minister some sort of put, it, put that on, a, on an autopilot. So although we cannot deny the speed and the, how impressive it was, uh, we can also not deny the concerns that are now, particularly in recent months, that are accompanying this great political opening, some as a direct uh, consequence of the opening, mm -hmm. um, some, you know, particularly when they have let uh, political parties to come into their countries, um, there was some uh, lack of clarity on terms and conditions of uh, armed um, uh, members of some opposition party, for example, the OLF, on how they will be um, conducting their activities in the country. There was some great lack of clarity on that. And so as a result of that political opening, we are seeing now the breakdown of rule and law, uh, the rule of law. So, uh, but I think, you know, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. Mm. That's that kind of situation that right. we are facing today. So I, I hear the nuance there. I want to share this tweet we got from Oga, who writes on Twitter, he's one of a kind Ethiopia has never seen. He already raised the bar, achieving what most could not in just 365 days. Yes, he has oppositions, both healthy and unhealthy ones, but these are challenges, and I'm sure the healthy ones will be tackled by the prime minister's leadership eventually. So just sharing with our audience what one of these achievements was, what it looks like. And of course, this is also um, something that relates to the story you heard at the top of the show with Abebe being able to go back. This headline from Quartz Africa, this was December of last year. For the first time in decades, there are no Ethiopian journalists in prison. And they, they share a picture there of another former stream guest, uh, Iskander Nega, a journalist who was released uh, that year. So just another one of the successes that people online are speaking about. about. Goitam, how would you rate this past year? Um, I think it's done well, uh, relatively speaking. I think what you can achieve in this type of situation is uh, is limited. It's essentially about minimizing damage, uh, given what he's inherited and given the challenges that he faced. Uh, we sort of have to rate the prime minister on his ability to minimize uh, the damage. And I think the results are mixed in that regard. Um, I was very happy that we had an internal reform rather than a revolution, um, because that would have been uh, much more violent and much more uh, messy, obviously. Um, but then now it looks like the consequences of revolution um, have simply been delayed rather than eliminated. Um, and I would attribute this primarily to one misgiving I have with the whole process, and that's the fact that um, the reform has been anchored in the persona of the prime minister. And I think that made it bound to not necessarily fail, but face loads of challenges from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the type of state that Ethiopia is. It's a federal state, first of all. Uh, and secondly, it's ruling party, the Ethiopian People's uh, Revolutionary Democratic Front. It's um, a front composed of four ethno-national parties. So both de facto and de jure power is very much decentralized in Ethiopia. And um, no matter who the prime minister is, their power is going to be constrained and limited by many forces. Um, and so in that regard, I thought it was very unfortunate that the prime minister 
spent most of the first year engaging opposition groups and opposition uh, individuals, politicians, who amongst themselves have, I don't know, the capacity to maybe I, I, win. I like to disagree with, with uh, Gautam yeah. there, but <laughs> so that, eh? go ahead. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I think I, I'm, I'm going to have to do a little bit of pushback on this um, mm. um, personality cult building narrative about the prime minister. Um, I do have a lot of criticism on uh, some of the things, some of the ways he's, uh, you know, articulating his uh, message and everything. But I think that's this 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 narrative of personality cult of the prime minister is coming in the background of, you know, uh, people want him. You know, he, there were a lot of openings and gaps that he needed to fill, whether traveling around the country or restoring the country's foreign policy and diplomatic shuttle and everything. He comes in the background whereby the last office of the prime minister is almost like a, va you know, a vacuum, uh, almost like we didn't have a prime minister in the office. So, and he comes also from the background of a country that was on the verge of collapse. So everybody wanted to see him. He needed to go everywhere. And of course, um, uh, he was doing that. And the other is, I think they are changing their way of communicating with Ethiopians, whether using the social media um, or using the state television and radio. Uh, they have changed that diametrically from what we knew it before. So that has somehow brought him more into each of our own devices, our own telephones and our own um, computers. And I think some of the things that he did are necessary to have been done. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, his tour in country tour were necessary to have been done. Uh, some of the measures they took in terms of improving the communication from the prime minister's office are necessary to have been done. More needed to be done, of course. There, there more clarity and more access to the media and everything. Right. And restoring the diplomatic um, stand of Ethiopia is also something necessary that needed to be done. So I, I that, think of course, brought him every day to our own the, consumption. Uh, let, let me intervene here. Uh, uh, I think one of the problems that the, the, prime, the prime minister faced is the fact that he inherited very <coughs> weak institutions, including the ruling party. Like Goitom pointed out, you know, this is a ruling party, a coalition of four uh, ethnic uh, parties. Mm -hmm. They are not actually parties. They are uh, ethnic movements mm -hmm. uh, which have uh, conflicting uh, uh, ideologies and agendas. Mm -hmm. uh, these weak institutions are the main problems for, for uh, the prime minister. Uh, if you look at the army, the army is fragmented. The security apparatus is very uh, uh, divided. Uh, at grassroots level, party officials are part of the problem uh, because it, it, instead of uh, restoring law and order, mm. they instigate any conflicts in many parts of uh, Ethiopia. And this is, uh, I think, one of uh, the major uh, crises that uh, the prime minister is facing. Mm. So I'm, I'm glad you raised that. And I, I've heard it in, in some of our other point? guests. Yeah. Uh, Goitam, I'm going to go to you with this, but I just want to bring in our community because they're watching this live. And one of the points that was just raised is something that so many of them want to talk about because we can't talk about successes without talking about what some see as failure. So um, let's agree to disagree. That's their handle. They say the ethnic conflict in Ethiopia has gotten worse since the prime minister took power power. IDPs in Ethiopia are now top in the world. The shocking reality is that Ebi contributed towards the crisis, both directly and indirectly. I want to share just one more, uh, Goitam. This is from Maruk, who says there's more chaos, killing, and internally displaced people day in and day out since he took office. He talks a lot, but he never puts that into practice. About releasing of political prisoners, it's due to people's two years of continuous protest. That is not because of him. So the idea of ethnic tension simmering and not being something that is being seen as a priority for the administration. What do you make of that? Yes, I was going to come to that point earlier. Um, my criticism of the uh, fact that the, the reform has been anchored in the personality of the prime minister is the fact that the Ethiopian state is intertwined with the EPRDF party structure. So this means that if the EPRDF is at odds with itself, it means that the Ethiopian state is at odds with itself. It means that they're not going to be able to provide security. They're not going to be able to contain uh, rebel groups, ethnic clashes, and so forth. And I think the last year, had Abiy spent much more time trying to build the EPRDF uh, to some sort of 
a more of a coherent political organization, reach some sort of political settlement amongst the different parties. Um, I think that would have uh, helped avoid a lot of the clashes that we see today. And without the APRDF, I don't think um, you can make much progress uh, in terms of uh, rebuilding security. You know, uh, the thing is, yes, the APRDF is uh, a key element in the whole political uh, process. There is no question about that. It's, it's a ruling party which dominated Ethiopian uh, politics for the last 27 years, 28 now. Uh, but as we all agree, Ethiopia is in a transition from authoritarian rule to a democratic and peaceful order. That is always a challenge for uh, any nation, especially a country like Ethiopia, which has been ethnically fragmented you know, deliberately. The constitution itself is a problem, as uh, uh, we all know, uh, because this uh, constitution divided people along ethnic lines. We have ethnic federation based on uh, the, the, the constitution. These uh, regions are ethnic enclaves. They are not highly cohesive and united. So uh, the whole structure itself is uh, extremely weak. We cannot solve uh, Ethiopia's political problem with the same uh, mindset, the mindset of, the, set of the, the ruling party. So in order to transition Ethiopia to a democratic order, I think Abi has to uh, bring on board key stakeholders, uh, other political parties, including the opposition, uh, if uh, there need be a transitional uh, kind of process. If not, a government is needed uh, to, to, to restore phase in uh, Ethiopia's transition to a democratic if order. If I can interrupt there, I think what we have seen the last year is that opposition forces literally have no constituency. Yes. Um, they were you know, invited from abroad. Before they actually came into the country, they had some grace. They were seen as some sort of political force. The moment they came into Ethiopia, it was obvious that these people could not mobilize more than 100 people amongst themselves. And the, both the conflicts and the solution to the conflicts, I think, is rooted in the EPRDF. These are the people with the guns. But These are, are the people that rule the Kabbalists. Let me correct you. Let me, co let, let me correct you. you. Let me correct them, you there, though. Them, there, there, are one, be to there are 108 uh, political parties in Ethiopia, most of them ethnic uh, parties. So uh, the majority of these parties uh, did not come from abroad. They, they were not in exile. The problem is they are highly fragmented and ethnic based. Which is why we have a, a tweet think, here. Yeah. Uh, I'll give this to you, Sadeli, but we have a tweet here just picking up on that from Rahel, who says, as things stand, Abi is still the better choice. What's more concerning to me is that none of the 100 plus political parties, including the ruling coalition, have inspired new ideas. What were you going to say, Sadeli? Um, that's a great idea that Rahel uh, raised there since you put up the, the, the tweet. But I'd like to add on, on two things on what Abeba said about. Uh, being ethnically fragmented and everything. Um, I think Goitom has uh, written a very good article the other day on Al Jazeera um, itself saying that, you know, Ethiopia has not ethnically divided itself since 27 years. It was uh, ever since it was built as a, as a state, 130 something years. Um, Ethiopia has always been an ethnic state, if we call, if we use the, the word ethnic, which I do not agree. Uh, to even describe the constitution itself as an ethnic constitution. I have responded to Goitam uh, uh, on a debate on Twitter on that one. But let me add this one. Abi Ahmed inherited a country that um, has a population of more than 100 million who are, you know, whose horizontal relationship has always been mediated by an authoritarian state. This is not Abi's making. Ethiopians have always had a state that was mediating their horizontal relationship among, you know, uh, the communal relationship itself has always been mediated by a state. What is happening since, uh, after Abi came is the loosening of that grip. This is one dynamic. The other one is one of the areas the prime minister is reforming, if we use that word, is the security. What does that mean? When he's reforming the security, who is left disgruntled? You know, what was the previous stand of the, the security in, um, uh, in being loyal to the constitution versus loyal to the political party that security forces are coming from. Uh, th this is what he has been touching for the last one year. Um, has it been completed? No, he himself said that it's not completed, but he has touched 
areas where a lot of people have been, a lot of people who are armed have been left disgruntled mm. and who wanted to leverage that one by instigating intercommunal violences in many places. So these are the two factors that we always need to keep in mind. One right. is Ethiopians have always had a government that was mediating their relationship. The second is, you know, touching the security sector will have its own consequences, and we are living that consequence today. Mm. So I wanted to bring up this idea from Getachu on Twitter because he's not convinced, and I hear what you're saying there about keeping in mind that history and what Ethiopia has historically been. Uh, Getachu says the regime, he calls it, of Abiy Ahmed has failed in controlling ethnic violence in Ethiopia. The international media is lenient on his failures. For instance, the humanitarian crisis, and he mentions just one place, is alarmingly horrific. Hundreds have been massacred and around a million displaced. I wanted to give this one to you, Abebe, because minutes before we went live on air, you were talking about the history of your fabulous blazer you're wearing today. And when we talk about violence and, and, and ethnic tensions, talk to us about what your outfit has to do with that. Yes. Uh, you know, I have worn this uh, colorful blazer uh, to convey a message. We uh, went to Arbamanj. Arbamanj uh, is uh, a, a city in uh, the southern part of Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and a group of uh, journalists from ISAT were awarded with these blazers, you know, in honor of our contribution for uh, the changes that have um, come to Ethiopia. Uh, the elders who gave us this uh, blazer are from the Gamo ethnic group. There was an amazing story last uh, September. There was a conflict. Uh, between the Oromos and the Gamo uh, in an area called Burayo. So many people were massacred and mm -hmm. around 15,000 people were displaced as a result of communal ethnic attack. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were young Gamo uh, people who wanted to attack Oromos, Oromo businesses in Arbamanj. Mm -hmm. What these elders did was they knelt down holding up leaves and uh, a bunch of grasses and calm down the situation. So this is the kind of example. We also need the traditional way of resolving conflict, mm. which is very important. And also, uh, civil society can also play a significant role in uh, you know, calming down uh, conflicts, in bringing about conflict mm. resolution uh, mechanisms. So you're on the same, uh, you're on the same wavelength. I, I, I'll go to you, Goitam, but you're on okay. the same uh, wavelength, Abebe is, uh, with this person, Oga, on Twitter, who says internal displacement has been one of the big issues of this past year, but I believe the Prime Minister's office can and should do more, but I don't believe that we as citizens are also doing our part to be part of the reform and be proactive on such issues. So he's talking about the civil society and, and the role of everyday people. But Goitam, what did you want to add? Uh, I was going to add that a lot of the violence is being perpetrated by organized groups rather than, you know, neighbors attacking neighbors. And I think this is really a function of the breakdown of law and order rather than some culture developing uh, of, of ethnic hatred or uh, some culturally rooted behavior, essentially. And again, I'll go back to my same uh, uh, argument that uh, this has to do with the breakdown of law and order in the state, the, in the infrastructure, the security infrastructure of the state, which is essentially, again, the EPRDF. So I think this is such a, a serious issue that we have to think about very immediate um, actions. Mm. And uh, the first and only sort of serious measure that I can think of is the EPRDF parties coming together, sitting down, agreeing uh, on a political settlement and then containing these organized groups that are going around displacing people um, and creating havoc. Right. Um, going to an excellent suggestion and one that we will have to look forward to seeing if that happens ahead of the 2020 parliamentary elections. I want to give the last word to Amina here on Twitter. She says, Rome was not built in a day. As a country that has been in an oppressive rule with little to no freedom of speech and idea, the last year has sparked hope for open talks and idea exchange. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this part of the conversation. But keep your thoughts coming on Twitter, at AJStream. Our thanks to Abebe, Sadale, and Goitam for being part of this conversation. We'll see you online. Thank you.